Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com, where you can also donate to support our work. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments on Facebook or Instagram. Welcome to the Two Testaments podcast, a guided journey through Scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. And in this episode, we're looking at Matthew 5 to 7, one of possibly the most famous passages in the whole Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. And we're talking with, well, I don't know if we can say one of the most famous scholars on the whole Bible, but uh, we are really grateful to have with us Dr. Jonathan Pennington. Pretty famous, for, I think, for his work on the Sermon on the Mount. Though. When you're talking and about Sermon on Matthew. the Mount, he really yeah. is the guy. Yeah. I mean, Jesus is the guy, but then we've got Jonathan <laughs> we're like, Pennington. We're like this. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Jonathan Pennington is professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he is the author of a number of books on uh, Matthew and the New Testament. Uh, I'll mention a couple here, The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. Uh, also, Jesus, the Great Philosopher which is a really fascinating uh, book, and Reading the Gospels Wisely. So he's written lots on the Gospels and on Matthew and on Jesus. And I don't have the book here, but Heaven and Earth in the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah. But thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So we have some overlapping interests in wisdom. And in fact, mm-hmm. you actually zoomed into my class on wisdom in the Bible and beyond back during the Zoom days mm-hmm. of the pandemic. And so really grateful for that. We used a chapter from Jesus, the Great Philosopher, okay, to think great. about wisdom in the New Testament. Good. Uh, and maybe I, I'd just be interested before we get into the sermon. Um, yeah. But I was going to just ask, reading the gospel wisely, Jesus, the great philosopher, can you just talk a little bit about how wisdom fits into your understanding of the New Testament and why that emphasis in these texts? Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. It's always wisdom with you. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, it really it does drive all of all three of those books you have in front of you that you mentioned mm-hmm. there, um, because I, I mean, I believe that the message of the Bible is God inviting us to become fully human, um, which can be talked about in terms of wisdom. The mm-hmm. way toward that, the way that we become fully human is through uh, receiving and learning to inhabit the world in the way of God's wisdom. So it really does go through all three of those books that have different goals. Each of those, the reading gospels wisely is about how to interpret the Gospels well. And Mm. the end goal of that is a kind of formative reading. Mm. Um, Sermon about human flourishing. The human flourishing is, as you guys know, and I'm sure we'll get into this key idea from ancient philosophy that is really about wisdom. And Jesus, the great philosopher, is is picturing Christianity, really trying to rediscover something that Christians used to talk about a lot, that Christianity is a whole way of life. It's a philosophy of life. It's not, I mean, it is a religion. It's a revealed religion. It's about personal salvation for sure, but that's all towards the goal of learning to inhabit the world in God's way. So I put wisdom as kind of the thread that ties all those together. Yeah. yeah. Well, wisdom is great, so. and it ties a lot of things yes. together. <laughs> you're, you're a pro-wisdom. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm right. pro-wisdom. Just Not so wait. much pro-wisdom Not the literature. literature. We know. We know. Literature. We know. I know, I know. I've, right. I've beat that dead horse uh, for a long time. Okay, so we talked about your interest in wisdom, but you're also really interested in the Sermon on the Mount in particular. Mm-hmm. You wrote a whole book on it. So what drew you to studying the Gospel of Matthew, but then the Sermon on the Mount in particular? Yeah. Uh, it's... You know, it's been a great joy to give the last 25 years of my life really to to studying these things a lot. But it's all um, happy providence from God. I don't think I set out to do any of the things I've done, really, in that sense. I was a seminary student in Chicago and happened to see a little curiosity about the Greek word for heaven Mm. and uh, did a study on it. And it resulted in me pursuing a PhD in Scotland and ended up writing a whole book on that on heaven and earth in Matthew. So again, I didn't really set out to do that or set out to be a gospel scholar. It was just, I followed my curiosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then so too, with the Sermon on the Mount, I was teaching Matthew every year. You guys were early students. My apologies for how (laughs) clueless I was in those early years of teaching, I'm sure. Um, but I saw in the course catalog, that there was a class offering for the Sermon on the Mount and nobody had taught it in forever. And I thought, oh, well, I know something about Matthew. I'll start teaching a class on the Sermon on the Mount. So I did, this was probably 12 or 13 years ago, and I very quickly realized that it was a whole world in and of itself. Mm. 
Um, in other words, like you can go in the library to BS 2575, which is the Matthew <laughs> section, but you can also go to a whole separate section of the Library of Congress numbering system just for the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is BT 480. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, but th the point is there aren't too many portions of the Bible, like portions of a book of the Bible that have their own Library of Congress yeah. number. And it's because the Sermon on the Mount has been the most influential portion of Scripture throughout the last 2,000 years. There are more commentaries and and uh, sermons and uh, the impact of it is greater than any other portion of the Bible. So for me, very quickly, as I started teaching the sermon, I realized, wow, it's like a whole world beyond Matthew connected to, but beyond what I had known about Matthew. And so it really, I just began a deep dive into ethics, into ancient philosophy and started to end the history of the interpretation of the sermon and started to realize, wow, there's a whole world here. So it was really a happy accident. I'm very thankful uh, because it's not only been a, a meaningful academic thing, I'd say it's significantly transformed my personal life as well mm -hmm. in terms of the kind of the vision of really reshaping my vision of what Christianity is in a mm -hmm. fundamental yeah. way. So, you know, you've talked about your personal interest mm -hmm. in this and, and the significance of the Sermon on the Mount, but we're here recording live today uh, with a number of students, both undergraduate students at Samford, where Ronnie and I are um, professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies, some Beeson students and some faculty. So what would be the case that you would make to them for why it would be important to study these three chapters out of the whole Bible? What's so significant about these chapters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Well, I think the reason they have been so important is because it's there are so many uh, big theological and ethical topics that, that really cross through the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, the question of what's the relationship of Torah or the Old Testament law to the New Testament? I mean, there are a lot of places that comes up in the New Testament, but there's no there's no single place that answers that, obviously. But Matthew 5, 17 and following is at the nuclear core of that. Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but I have come to fulfill. And then what, it, what does that mean? So, I mean, talk about one of the biggest mm. issues of the whole two testaments, you know, the canon. Uh, it's right there, you know, in, in the sermon. And then the you know, so many, it's like a greatest hits, mm -hmm. like, you know, like you can listen to Hotel California. It's awesome. <laughs> and you can also listen to the, to the Eagles greatest hits album. You're like, okay, there's a lot of good stuff in here. And that's kind of how the Sermon on the Mount is, yeah. uh, is that you've got, just start thinking about things like the Beatitudes or the idea of turning the other cheek, or, um, you've heard it said, but I say to you, or the, uh, wise and foolish builders it just goes on and on. It's like a greatest hits of many of Jesus' teachings. And they, and that's because there are so many big topics that are touched on. So, um, I guess that's what I'd say. Yeah. How do you see the Sermon on the Mount fitting in the Gospel of Matthew as a whole? And do you think it has some kind of discernible structure that can help us in, interpret it and approach it? Matthew overall, in that sense, or the uh, sermon? The structure of the well, sermon both, in particular. Both, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, it is a very important aspect of understanding Matthew, which you will be as you go through this whole thing, I'm sure, is to understand that all of Matthew has a very significantly... Um, planned out structure, I think probably more than any other book of the New Testament, maybe the Old Testament even, I don't know. Um, and that is that you have these five major teaching blocks. That's one of the most common things that is recognized about Matthew uh, that are interspersed with narratives or stories about what Jesus did. And that's really one of the main ways Jesus is being presented as a philosopher, actually, in Matthew, is that because what you need from a philosopher that is a wisdom teacher is both a record of what they said that teaches you, but also a record of how they lived. And that combination of both their, their words and their model of life is what you need if somebody's worth following. Because right. if they just say a bunch of stuff but, but stuff, but their life isn't model it, then they're not worth listening to. And so Matthew, I think, really intentionally mm -hmm. gives us this interweaving of stories about Jesus and things he said. And the things he said are collected largely into those five big teaching blocks. And the first of them is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. So so actually, when you think about, as I've thought about over the years, about the significance of the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's weird because in some ways it is, the, in some ways, the most important part of the Bible. But it's also, for Matthew, only one of his five mm -hmm. teaching blocks. So it's kind of, so I've, I've gone back and forth in my mind whether it is, it is uh, as 
It should be as highlighted as it has been because it's really only one of the five. It is the first, right? It is the first. <laughs> but a good argument can be made sure. about the structure of Matthew. I don't know if you're, any of your guests have talked about this, that chapter 13 is very possibly the chiastic center mm -hmm. of the whole book. There's there's a decent argument to be made mm -hmm. for that, which is the third discourse, the mm -hmm. third of the five, right? So I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the structure of the sermon, yeah, I have a whole chapter on that. I'm literally the son of an English professor. So I, I, I do love, I do love literary structure, but I also think that it's, it's, um, very important part of understanding the sermon is to see how well it's structured. And you had Dale Allison on here and mm -hmm. I've learned much of that from him. Um, the threes, everything's built on threes. That's one of the things Allison points out. And I think the whole sermon is built on a series of threes. Yep. So how does that work out a little bit? I mean, I'm sure it's kind of complex, but yeah, no, it's doable. Uh, you think about your high school research paper, you have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a conclusion. <laughs> it really does work that way. Uh, 5, 1 to 12, or sorry, 5, 1 to 16 is the introduction. 5, 17 to 7, 12 is the body, and 7, 13 to 27, 28, depending on how you break it, is the conclusion. It really does work that easily. And then with each of, within each of those sections, they're broken up into threes, but just take the middle section, 5, 17 to 7, 12, it's broken into three big chunks. And then inside of those, those have a series of threes as well. So one of the structural things is that the, the literal center of the whole Sermon on the Mount, the center of the center of the center is the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And so historically, a lot of Christians have seen the Lord's Prayer and tried to actually interpret the sermon out from there. Mm -hmm. um, every time I've read those older and current versions of that, they never totally convince me. Like, I, I want to believe and they kind of explain some of the things and not others. Yeah. But it is true that at the heart of the sermon is the Lord's Prayer, which, again, is one of those greatest hits moments oh, of yeah. the Bible, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you find most difficult about the Sermon on the Mount for interpreters, for you personally? Um, hmm. I feel like a lot of the things that are in the sermon, uh, I've. I did have to wrestle with, they were difficult, but I feel I've got more clarity on them. Like what a beatitude is, which we'll probably get to that, what those what those first things Jesus is saying are about, those beatitudes. The issue of the relationship of the law, you know, do not think I've come to abolish, but to fulfill, that's obviously a complex one. But in terms of within people who study the Sermon on the Mount, but seven six is the uh, is the most notoriously difficult. Do not give your dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. Nobody knows what that means. You know? and, <laughs> I mean, really, seriously, it's all over the place. Um, and then how those verses fit in with the rest of chapter seven. That, that's probably the when you I've read a lot of commentaries on the sermon, and every one of them at this point kind of just the wheels kind of fall off, you know, a little bit. And so, okay. So pigs yep. and dogs, what, what do you, what do you, what's your best guess as to what <laughs> no, the really? pigs okay. and dogs refer to? <laughs> Since I just said that nobody knows. You know, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Throw it up there, yeah, no, no. Yeah. If you look at it, if you look at chapter seven, I think it's um, in typical wisdom, Literature, fashion, sorry, wisdom. <laughs> Can I say that phrase? What am I? What am I supposed to replace it with? Teaching about wisdom. Okay, in <laughs> okay, in typical wisdom mode or whatever. Um, what you have in seven one to five are really, you know, like everything, very personal, like r really powerful words about not judging other people, and they're and even that's complicated because you need a lot of wisdom to figure out what that means and what it doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. Because it clearly doesn't mean don't ever say anything is right or wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. Jesus is saying all kinds of things are right or wrong. <laughs> right. The whole, so it doesn't mean that, but it does. it is a very strong challenge to us to check our hearts when it comes to being judgmental and harsh and mm -hmm. towards others. So it's very powerful. And it ends, of course, with another one of the greatest hits images again of the plank and speck, you know, mm -hmm. looking at someone else's speck while you have a plank in your eye. I mean, it's very... Very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that, that I think, is balanced in a typical wisdom way with 7-6 then. So in other words, so you think of how the Proverbs might say, um, answer a, cool, a fool according to his folly and don't answer a fool according to his folly, right? Yep. So there's a sense in which 7-1 to 5 and 7-6 are kind of like balancing mm -hmm. each other. 7-1 mm -hmm. to 5 is talking about not um, making sure that you're not judgmental towards other people. And then 7-6 is like, and also be wise because some people are not 
trustworthy and some people are not, you know, not, they're just not trusted. They're not mm-hmm. safe to share certain mm-hmm. things, even deep theological truths. So mm-hmm. I, that's my best stab at it is that it's a, uh, it's yeah, a balancing kind of wisdom approach. I was just thinking, so. just thinking as you were talking in verse seven, asking it will be given to you. Do you I mean, is there like a, is it possible there's a sense in which, okay, so you also don't be a dog or a pig <laughs> so you can receive what's holy? Or is, am I, don't I, know. Am I going I mean, a little wild? Well, no, I mean, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is where the structure of this whole part, really, everybody struggles to figure out how these all yeah. these things, how I often joke about this, it's not totally true, but it's like you wrote that research paper in high school <laughs> and you had like all your points on note cards. You remember that? If you still did that. And then you got to the end and it's like 11.58 and you're supposed to turn it in. And then you look under the table and there's like another stack of research cards. You're like... Dang it. I was supposed to put those in there. This sometimes feels like that. Like yeah. he said all these amazing <laughs> things. I'm like, oh, I'm about to say these things too. I mean, I think it's more structured than that, but that's how it often sure. feels at right. the end. He's got like all these things he's saying, you know? Yeah. So, so. Uh, are there themes that hold it all together though, even though it can sometimes feel a little disjointed and maybe that's a reflection of for the sure. threes within threes within threes. Uh, no, no. I think there's a theme that holds it all together for sure. And it's uh, wholeness. Um, it's the idea that what God sees and cares about is not just our, our, our external actions, those do matter, um, but that our hearts, our, our interior person is aligned with our exterior person. And this is why the theme of um, hypocrisy is so important throughout Matthew, but including in the Sermon on the Mount. When you and I hear the word hypocrisy, we think of someone who says one thing and does something different um, or they are living a double life. So, you know, horrible situations where, a you know, supposedly righteous person, a pastor, or whoever is then doing really bad things. And that is a kind of hypocrisy, but that's actually not the kind of hypocrisy that Jesus is addressing here. He's addressing a much more subtle and maybe some ways more deadly, I guess. And that is that the kind of hypocrisy where we actually do live a good life on the outside, but our hearts are dead. Mm-hmm. And, and, and far from God. And this is something that's going to come up throughout Matthew, say in chapter 15, where he quotes Isaiah and says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing that ties it together, especially the middle section, 517 to 712, is God really, Jesus inviting us to pay attention to what's going on on the inside, not just on the outside. And so the theme that ties it all together then is wholeness, that he wants us to be whole people, um, not just, not split people. Mm. So there's a lot more we could say about that from sure. 548 and things. We might come back to yeah. it. Yeah. The, uh, so the Sermon on the Mount begins with all these blessings or beatitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, you know, and so on and so on. Now, in your book, The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing, you press us to reconsider whether blessed is the best way to translate the underlying Greek term makarios. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's wrong with translated, translating it as blessed? And what do you think is a better way to translate that repeated term here? Yeah. This was one of the most important things that took me a long time to figure out and um, really changed a lot for me. Um, and it all came down to translation because after I literally spent about five years of my life thinking about how to translate that word, <laughs> I'm not joking. And I finally realized, and I read everything on it and just, you know, was teaching it and thinking about it. I finally realized it's an English problem because in Hebrew in Greek in Latin Actually, in every other language, I've, and like probably 25 other languages I've talked to fluent speakers about, every other language has two different words that we use one word for in English, and it creates a lot of confusion. The two different words are one relates to the idea of God or through a priest, God directly or through a priest, bringing life, like speaking or bringing life and fertility and flourishing. And, and that's one way of sense of blessing, to bless you know, to with words, especially to bring to life. The other set of words refer to what a wisdom teacher does or what a father or a mother does uh, for their child or their you know, young man or young woman, where you put your arm around somebody and say, look, that this way of inhabiting the world is what's going to bring you true life. So you think of like Proverbs 1 to 9. This is how Proverbs works. It's Mm -hmm. a father saying to his son, you know, it's kind of a literary guise of a father saying to his son, 
go these ways because these will give you life. Be faithfulness to your spouse and honest scales and business and being faithful to your friends. And if you go these ways, it's not going to go well with you. Or Psalm 1 is obviously the big one, the mm-hmm. wisdom psalm that starts it all. Oops. Uh, the, the psalm <laughs> that includes wisdom themes that is starting it all. Uh, and that is, um, you know, two ways. And it's all about two, it's always about two ways, right? I mean, this is the, the wisdom way is the, here's one way that leads to life. Here's one way that's not mm-hmm. going to lead to life. Mm-hmm. And so once I realized that's what's going on here, but again, all these other languages use two different words for them. And we only use the word blessed for both of those, and it creates a lot of confusion. Um, and so the, once I realized that these are not statements of the first kind, God is blessing someone. These are statements of the second kind, which is where a wisdom teacher is putting his arm around you and saying, let me show you the way that's going to bring you life. And so that's why I translate it as flourishing, which isn't perfect either. Sometimes you'll see translations say happy, but that. You know, that doesn't really work either because happy is such a thin word in English now. Mm-hmm. It just means kind of a temporary state of emotional positivity. But the idea is flourishing. The idea is here's the way of inhabiting the world that where you're going to find life. And that's what a macrism And the reason we call them beatitudes, if you know your Latin, beatus, anybody know what beatus means? It means anyone? <laughs> the reason we call them beatitudes is because the Vulgate, the Latin translation of it. We got a lot of our titles from the Vulgate. Um, it means happy. It means mm. flourishing. Mm. Um, and in Aristotle, the word, the Greek word makarios, makar, makarios, and then its equivalent eudaimonia mm. means flourishing or happy. And that's what this word is here. It's, it's an invitation to life, find life. So if so, we were to just apply that Flourishing are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or flourishing are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How mm-hmm. does that play out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the whole shocking genius of Jesus' Beatitudes. So, like, if you, so every human culture makes Beatitudes. So we have them. You have them on bumper stickers. We have them on, bumper, you know, whatever it is. Um, t shirts. T shirt, yeah. I mean, we, we have these statements that are meant to give us a vision for how to live, you know. Um, you know, relationships are better than things. I don't know. I just, that's not a very clever one. I just made that up. But whatever it is, you know, or help me. When you think of someone, I can only think of some goofy ones. Um, but, you know, there, there are statements that guide us. They're kind of pithy little statements that guide our thinking, you know, on how to live. Um, and so that's what these are, but what's shocking about them is that the things Jesus says are flourishing are very unexpected. Mm. They are almost entirely negative. And we're so used to um, these being like kind of nice, positive little words from Jesus or something that we don't maybe pause and think about how negative they are. Flourishing are the poor in spirit. Mm. That is those who are experiencing Poverty, it's a very negative image. Poverty in spirit of brokenness and humility is how most Christians have taken this. But the idea that you're experiencing, you know, everything's not going well. There's a brokenness. So you recognize your sin and your guilt and your shame. Flourishing are those who mourn. You know, those who are, this could mean, you know, personal mourning, but also probably in its context from Isaiah, especially mourning about the brokenness of the world and the suffering of God's people, longing for God to come and set the world to right. Think of Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort all those who mourn. Mm -hmm. Um, Flourishing are the meek. What is a meek person? It doesn't, meek doesn't mean weak. This is kind of a weird word in English now because meek, what what the word here means is actually more like someone who has self-restraint under duress. And so they're, they're quite powerful, but it's a kind of power that doesn't need to win. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of power that is self-controlled. And he's saying that actually, that place, that space when you inhabit the world in a way where you don't always have to win and you're not flexing and you're not, you know, it's not not even be real. It's even better than be real. Um, it's, it's like it's not, not posturing. You're actually just strong and centered and not needing to win. That's a place of true happiness. Hungering and thirsting. Negative images again. Mm. Um, the only, uh, merciful um, peacemakers. What these mean is that you know, let's say somebody wrongs you, um, you don't have to. You don't always have to be right. 
you know, you make peace. To forgive someone means you actually let some things go, even things that were done wrong to you. You know, not mm-hmm. everything in every situation, obviously, but but the posture of of being willing to be wronged. Yeah. You know, so Which could connote weakness. Right. right exactly. And loss. Yeah. yeah but and if you, don't, if you still don't see the negativity, look at how it ends. Look at verse 10. Flourishing are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Who likes that? Nobody. And then if he if he still didn't get it, he makes it more personal in verse 11. Flourishing are you when others revile you persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you? How many like it when somebody says something bad about you, even if it's true, let alone if it's untrue? Um, And so the whole point of this is that once you sort of realize the things he's saying are true happiness or flourishing are shocking and not expected, then it makes sense that the second half of each of the Beatitudes, there's a reason why he says the crazy, right? And he says flourishing or the poor in spirit. How could that be? Because those are actually the people that are part of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Flourishing are those who mourn because they'll be comforted. Mm-hmm. Flourishing are the meek. They'll actually inherit the earth and it goes on. So that took me a long time to kind of see that because the, the word blessed often trips us up to make us think that if you do this, God will bless you or something. I, I think it's just these are really confusing with that word. But if you recognize these, this is Jesus saying you want to find true life. It's not found in the way that you think it is. It's actually found in ways that feel very counter-natural. Um, and that is, I think, can be summed up with the great Christian truth that life comes through death. You know, the great paradox of, of the Christian truth. So maybe that's a longer answer than you wanted. But it's a really, it's a really, um, it's too late now. Yeah. And it's also really, uh, <laughs> that was a turning point for me, yeah. just to kind of see that, that difference. All right. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. shine? Okay, never, good. You know, everyone knows this. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought I was going to sing it with a little bit more um. Right, you promised so, me you were going to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointed. Sorry, Well, um, So, you know, we read this in 5.16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that you may, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So what does it mean to let your light shine before others? Um, because I suspect when I was a kid and sang that song, I didn't, I, it was a cool song. Cute. Don't, don't, don't let Satan blow it out. Yeah, don't let right. Satan blow it out. Yeah. What is, and what, and what does it mean that people are going to see this and then give glory to, uh, mm-hmm. your father in heaven? Like they're going to like see it and then be converted or like, what's mm-hmm. going on here? Yeah. 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 That part I think is ambiguous. Okay. Like what that means you, know, you can't help but think of like Philippians 2 and the idea of every knee shall bow, okay. um, which I think if you press into that means maybe some joyfully and some reluctantly. I don't, okay, you know, it's, sure. it's, it's a weird kind of thought, sure. you know, and I wonder if it's comparable here in the sense of people glorifying your father. But or it may just be more imminent in the sense of like people seeing you live as lo- people of love and uprightness and. That honors God in some way. Yeah. But I think the, the bigger issue is to recognize that salt and light are mutually informing metaphors or images. And unfortunately, they're often kind of thought of separately. And if we went around and said, what do you think salt of the earth means? For whatever reason, the popular notion, I would be curious what people say, but it's probably preservative or something, which, you know, is certainly possible. Salt means a lot of different things. It's a very open Hmm. metaphor, but light is pretty clear, especially in light of, no pun intended, um, Isaiah that was just quoted back in 415. Um, It's the idea that light is talking about God uh, returning and revealing. You know, light is a revelatory kind of idea. And if you look at verses 13 to 16 of of chapter 5, you'll see that they're clearly in parallel you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. They both have the same thing. Don't, don't hinder the saltiness, don't hinder the light. Mm-hmm. And so they're meant to be parallel. And when I think you put those together, salt and light, I think this is a priestly image, is what I'd say. It's, a, it's an ambassadorial image. It's a, it's a going forth image. So how I think this all structures together is he's just given us these shocking statements about where true life is to be found. He concludes it by saying that the ultimate way you're going to find life is in the midst of being persecuted for connection with Christ, which is certainly not an an exciting prospect. You know, we don't, you know, 
come to Stanford where we you will be killed at the end or something. You know, but nobody <laughs> does that. Christian education where you will die or something. You know, it's it's not it's not an appealing thing. And so it's a very unexpected uh, way to end these statements on happiness. And, and scary, actually. People are going to revile you. And, and so I think verses 13 to 16 are, again, a balancing to that and saying, okay, in light of that, that my followers are actually going to experience a lot of persecution and suffering and malignment and reviling, don't shrink back mm-hmm. from being my heralds, to, mm-hmm. uh, for being my priests in the world. Don't, don't stop being salt and don't stop being light. That is shedding forth the goodness of God, but in fact do that and they will in a mysterious kind of paradoxical way glorify your father in heaven. So that's why I think it all flows together. Right. Yeah. Well, let's move on to 517. And as the resident Old Testament scholar Great. here, I feel like we need to talk about this <laughs> For one. For sure we do. Yeah. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. So I'm glad it looks like I'm still in for a job. I still have a job here, right? The law and the prophets still have some relevance. How how do we understand this verse, though? How do people generally understand it? Uh, And then how do you think we should understand it? Yeah, no, it's such, I mean, this is obviously the, uh, one of the couple most difficult and uh, perplexing issues to put together the whole Bible. You know, the problem of evil is another one up there. You know, if God is all good and sovereign, why is there evil in the world? Okay, if you've never thought about that, sorry, I just ruined your weekend. But uh, that one stinks. Um, And then this one is probably the most relevant, but it almost is difficult. Like how if God spoke and his words are eternal, how in the world does then what do we do with Deuteronomy or Leviticus or something in our lives? I mean, obviously it's a huge issue. And of course the church wrestled with this from the very beginning. And you even see lots in the pages of the new Testament, lots of people wrestling with this. you think of the book of acts culminating? They have to all get together and have a big powwow and disagreement. Do people need to obey the Mosaic covenant if they're becoming Christians. And Peter finally stands up and he tells his testimony of how that didn't happen with Cornelius and Paul is there, you know, maybe later uh, that ends up being an issue with Paul a lot. He's writing a lot of his letters on this same issue, Galatians, et cetera. So it's obviously, uh, it was an issue in the new Testament and it continues to be an issue throughout all the church's history. And in a lot of ways, denominations are kind of, this is one of the things that splits denominations. Uh, the difference between a Presbyterian view on this versus a Lutheran view, even on this to some degree. I mean, the Presbyterian tradition would say there's a third use of the law. The Lutheran tradition would say no, you know, um, the law just shows you that you stink, you know, and you, you suck basically, you know, the, and so there, and then beyond that, lots of other Wesleyan traditions and others. It's not the only issue, but it's one of the big issues, you know, so it's complicated. My take on it, um, is that, um, Jesus is modeling here. And especially you have to keep reading the sermon to see this, uh, both, a con- that there's a continuity and a discontinuity, between what he is saying and bringing into being. So the continuity is that God has always seen and cared about the inner person because that's what he's going to unpack. He hasn't come to abolish that idea. God, God hasn't changed. He's in the Old Testament. He also cared about who you were as a person. He never related to people in this kind of legalistic, mechanistic way. But the discontinuity is that a new era has dawned, and I think the book of Galatians really does help us understand this, that the Mosaic Covenant came after the Abrahamic Covenant uh, to narrow down God's witness in the world to an ethnic people and to raise up the seed, who is the Christ, Paul says. And now that that has happened, the Abrahamic fulfillment, which was came into being before there were any Jewish people, this is Paul's argument in Galatians, uh, that it is... Abraham was a Gentile. He was a non-Jew. And so all people are now welcome to be part of this covenant that is now through Christ, who is the exact representation of God on the earth in a way that Moses was not. He was only an instrument, not the actual incarnation. And so now this, through Christ, there is a discontinuity with the Mosaic covenant. There's something new has come. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's holding together 
the abiding voice, or as one of my mentors, Chris Seitz, would say, you know, the, per se, the per se voice, the abiding voice of God's words in the Old Testament, but always understood in light of the final revelation uh, that has come through Christ. So it's a combination of continuity and discontinuity, and you have to drill down in a case-by-case -case basis, but that's the overall idea. What, what do you think about that? Well, I wonder <laughs> if Jesus is, is he drilling down on a case-by-case -case basis as we move forward in chapter five? Is that part of what he's doing as he brings up, you've heard it said, but I say to you? Yeah, I actually think chapter five and six are more on the continuity side than the discontinuity side. Um, because I think what we see when you start reading these examples is that they are showing that God intended always for what he re revealed to be lived out internally, not just externally. And yet the human tendency, including Jesus' opponents in his day, were to, and us too, were to externalize the faith and make it about actions and not about our interior person. And I think this, so I think these verses 521 and following are emphasizing God has always seen and cared about the heart. I'm, I'm not actually abolishing the law. I'm telling you what the law has always said. Mm -hmm. The discontinuity comes in, you've heard it said, I say to you, <laughs> because no prophet in the Old Testament ever showed up and said, God has said, and now here's what I'm telling you. <laughs> not, not at all. I mean, there's a, the, the discontinuity comes in the authority, mm -hmm. and that's how the Sermon on the Mount ends. You remember it ends with them saying, this guy teaches with authority we've never seen, not like our scribes. And he's uneducated. You know, he's not a scribally educated person. So I think the continuity and discontinuity are both in there um, in what in the verses that are unpacked. So, so the you have heard it said, and I say to you, I mean, it sounds like you're... I translate that not as but, but They're and. not as but, but as yeah. and. And so it's not even a contrast with, let's say, the teaching of other fellow Jews who are, and they're kind of competing with how they interpret the law? I don't no. think for okay. the most part. It gets a little tricky at some points on different sure. views of divorce and remarriage and the hating your enemies, which we talked about a little bit before this sure. started today. Um but yes, generally, I think he's challenging them to reconsider what God has always revealed while also now offering himself as the true arbiter of the law. Okay. So he is now the one who gives the final authoritative interpretation of it. But that interpretation is largely one that goes for the interior person being aligned with God. So, yeah, so maybe we can look at how that plays yeah, out with sure. some specific examples. First one's a great example. Can we example. go rapid fire here? Yeah, we can take a few of these okay. on. So you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, so this is NRSV, that if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the Gehenna of fire. What's going on? Yeah. I think it's what I just said, um, that our natural tendency is to externalize God's commandments and to self-justify and think, well, I'm not, I haven't killed anybody, you know, so I'm a good person. But he's saying, okay, I'm glad. I don't want you to kill people. <laughs> the external actions do matter. But are you full of hatred and bitterness towards others? Um, if so, that's not the wholeness that... Mm. I am, he himself is saying, when we get to 548, we'll see this is riffing on Leviticus 19:20. As God is whole and holy, so too we are to be. So I think he's, um, this is a really good example of this, that he's challenging us to pay attention to what's going on on the inside, not just what's going on the outside. And as far as I know, there aren't, I don't think there are a lot of religions that do this. You know, in, in terms Push of to the interior. Yeah, in I think most religions, especially in the ancient world, um, focused on the actions, the sacrifices you need to do, the rituals you needed to go through. And you could do those things with it does not matter what your attitude towards them is. It's purely the act of doing them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's what's pretty amazing about biblical Christianity. Judaism and, and Christianity is that. God has always seen and cared about 
who you are on the in, it, it, the interior person. If you if you're going through all the motions and you're not connected with God in the inside, it doesn't matter, really. And I think that's what these are saying. Yeah. Right. So we see that over and over again with things like adultery, adultery and, and swearing yep. and an eye for an eye. And, and But then we get I know. the <laughs> end. Be perfect, yeah. therefore, as your heavenly Father yeah. is perfect. So is Jesus expecting moral perfection? And you've even pushed it further, not just in our exterior actions, but in, in our interiority, we should be perfect as well. So what does that mean? Yeah. I hate to say this, but it's another case where the translation is really problematic. Um, and that sounds like something that I'm completely opposed to, that if you can read Greek and Hebrew, you can unlock <laughs> the magic of the Bible or something. That's not at all the case. Um, but this is a case where the English word perfect is misleading um, because the the word and a whole family of Greek words here mean more like um, whole and mature or complete. It's only perfect in the English sense of... I think it was the Browns a few years ago, was it, that lost every game. Um, and some people said at the time, like the however, 13 games or something, they had a perfect season. Um, <laughs> and that is the older sense of perfect, meaning it's consistent with itself. Um, and that is what that's what the older English word meant, consistent or complete or whole. It's of one piece, right? But now the English word perfect means free from sin. And that's not what he's saying. I mean, there's no expectation that we're going to be free from sin. When he says you must be teleos, it's it's whole, which is a summation then of what he's just argued in 521 through 47. Don't just do it externally, do it internally. So the whole point is you have to be consistent. And again, that's a riff on Leviticus 19 and 20, where God reveals himself and says, be holy as I am holy. And the reason I think Jesus uses teleos or wholeness rather than hagias or holiness is because if he said, be holy as your heavenly father is holy, the Pharisees would be like, darn right. That's exactly our point. Mm -hmm. All you riffraff who are not obeying all the laws and all of our traditions, you're not holy and we are. And but what he's unpacking here is Holiness isn't just doing a bunch of stuff. Holiness is actually paying attention to your interior person. So I think the better translation of 548 is be whole as your heavenly father. I even translate it as be virtuous. And if you want to use the word virtue, I think that's fine too. Um, as your heavenly father himself is whole. James 1, he is not a shifting shadows. He's not inconsistent. He is, he is whole in himself. And so too, he's calling us to be. So. Yeah, great. Uh, let's turn now to the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6. Um, and I won't even read it because I think, you know, most people have some passing familiarity, at least, with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, does Jesus expect his disciples to pray these exact words? Is that what he, sa what he means when he says pray in this way, or does he mean something else? Yeah. Well, let me first just observe that the Lord's Prayer is part of the argument of chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. It's, again, a set of three examples of the interior matter mattering, not just the out, the exterior. So you've got, he has three examples, uh, almsgiving, which is helping to give the poor to help, help money to give the help the poor praying and fasting. And in each case, the point is if you're just doing this on the outside and you're not paying attention to what's on the inside, then it doesn't matter if you're just going through the motions, right? So the Lord's prayer is part of that argument. And it begins, as you can see there with, um, chapter 6, verses 5 and following, he's talking about not praying in a way to receive praise from others. And then in verse 7, chapter 6, verse 7, not praying in a way that is just heaping up words, you know, that, which again is this kind of ritualistic approach. If you just kind of say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, or something a bunch of times or whatever it is, that somehow that'll like unlock God's yeah. door to you or something. Instead, um, it, the whole point is, What's pay attention to what's going on inside. And then he offers a very simple prayer, a prayer that's rooted in other Jewish prayers. It's not like it's completely original, um, but it is very simple and direct addressing to God as father and asking him to provide for us and also being honest about our brokenness and asking him to protect us in that. And then it ends in verse 14 and 15 with these you know, powerful words about interpersonal relationships. So are we supposed to pray these words? Well, I think, um, 
you can fall off the knife edge on either side. You know, some traditions pray these words as a kind of rote ritualistic way of saying it. And then that's ironically the opposite. It's using his words to do what he just said not to do in, in verses seven, seven and eight, you know? Um, and then others probably in lower church traditions, Baptist world, et cetera, et cetera. They never pray this prayer because it sounds too Catholic or something, you know? And so that's obviously not helpful either. I think the wisdom is to pray these words regularly and to use them as uh, instruction for how to pray. So some commentators have described them as like a scaffolding. Mm-hmm. These words are like a scaffolding around the building of, of our prayer lives or like a handrail as you ascend the tower of prayer in your heart mm-hmm. is that they guide you. So those are great images, I think, yeah. to, to use them. Yeah. I, when I when I worship in traditions that, ha- that pr- many churches pray these words at some point in the liturgy every week, and every time I do, I'm like, well, we should do that. I mean, these are good words. They do shape us in significant ways, you know. Yeah. And so. what do you think is the gist, if there are one or two gists of what mm-hmm. exactly Jesus is instructing his disciples to pray here? Yeah, that's a good question. I I think it is a an orientation of our lives, um, our earthly lives towards the coming heavenly realities. So I think if you look at verse the end of verse 10, uh, so this threefold prayer, let your name be hallowed, which, or what's the NRSV say, you know, we don't use the hallowed word, be your name. hallowed be your name. Is yeah. The it's, it's so traditional yeah. that we say that, but of course we don't even know what that word, we, we only have that word for a couple of things now, Halloween, we've had that. Right. And then now definitely hallows, which is cool. <laughs> so thank you, JK for, for adding another <laughs> reference point for hallowed. But beyond that, we have no idea what it means, but it means let it be seen or made holy. And so maybe a better translation is our father who's in heaven, let your name be honored. Uh, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. All three of those are modified by that next phrase. As these things are true in heaven, where God's name is honored, or where he, yeah, his name is honored, his king, he does reign fully and completely, and his will is done. Those things are heavenly realities. Make them true on earth as well. And so that's like this fundamental orientation of how the Christian lives in the world. We're longing for God to come and set the world to right. And in the meanwhile, we live according to that way of inhabiting the world. And that's what's unpacked in this other part. Dependence on God, um, f- receiving forgiveness and offering forgiveness to others. And this difficult verse, verse 13, lead us not to temptation, which I think probably means something more like uh, do not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Spare us in our moments of trial that we don't then come to test you like the, the Israelites did in the wilderness, that their trials were such that they turned against God. God, let that not be true of us as well. So I think it's this fundamental orientation for how to live as a Christian in the world. That's why it's so important. Now, the rest of chapter six incorporates a number of lessons on money. So mm. do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, 619. You cannot serve God and wealth or mammon, mm-hmm. verse 24. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you'll wear. That's verse 25. So what is Jesus's attitude here towards money? So yeah, 619 to 34 does pivot toward um, our life, our daily bread kind of life. And the the deceitfulness of riches and the the power that riches have over us, uh, and and I think the the theme of interior, not just exterior, um, life is continuing here, because he's pointing out that if you look at six twenty one, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Heart meaning again your interior person, not just your emotions, but your whole interior person. And so he, what he's doing, he's he's talking about the the foolish power of the goods and things of the world to corrupt our hearts. And, and actually what happens verse 24, when we try to serve two masters, notice that's a lack of wholeness, the Mm -hmm. same thing here. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a lack of consistency. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we try to serve two masters, namely the things of the world and God, the result, if you look at 625 and following is not peace, but actually anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
and I could just testify that's certainly been true in my life as well, um, that when when I'm trying to kind of live with one foot in dedication to money and all the luxuries it can buy and one foot in dedication to, um, you know, various aspects of service and not, and not living that way, when I try to do both, it doesn't really bring me peace. It brings me more anxiety. And I think if you look at 625 and following, he's pointing out the foolishness of trying to kind of live in this split way. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about anxiety kind of psychologically, which everybody has, we all have a lot of anxiety and some people have a lot. Anxiety is a normal part of human life. And it's really... Um, a splitting of your soul between the present and an imagined negative future. If you think about it from that perspective, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a tearing of yourself away from the presence and the present to some feared situation that may happen uh, or may, and probably won't actually. Uh, most of the things we're anxious about don't actually happen, but sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's that same splitness. You know, and he's saying there's no there's no life there. And so the solution to it is found in 33. Seek first, make prime, give primacy in your heart um, to God's kingdom and his righteousness. And these things will be added to you. So I think it's the same theme. It's saying pay attention to your heart when it comes to the things of the world, because they have the great potential to misguide us. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Sermon on the, Mint, on the Mount ends with... Sermon on the Mint. That would be pretty mint, cool, yeah. Know, wouldn't it? Right. Um, the Sermon on the Mount ends with a really strong emphasis on works, right? So, for instance, uh, in verses 15 to 20, he talks about um, how you know a good tree by its fruit. Or verse 24, which says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now, many Christians of particular Protestant varieties, I think, have a hard time, like a kind of aversion to works, right? Mm -hmm. Probably because, uh, you know, they hear some way of reading Paul with his, you know, kind of criticism of works of the law. But how does the end of the Sermon on the Mount and really the entire Sermon on the Mount uh, handle works and ethical action, if you think? Yeah, it's a good question. And that is actually the whole point of the sermon. <laughs> it is an invitation to inhabit the world in the ways that accord with Christ and his coming kingdom, because only therein will we find life. I mean, there's, there's the summary. That's why I should quote that. I, write that down and send it to me because I like that. Um, It'll be on this yes, podcast. Right, okay, forever. Good. It, yeah, I'll yeah. go back and quote myself. <laughs> Can I refer? Uh, no, but that, Make that sure you is, cite the podcast. Right, I will. <laughs> uh, that, that is, I mean, it's, it's a very important question. And this was a big part of my whole journey with the sermon is coming as a Protestant how do you read the sermon and how does this call to virtue and this call to a way of inhabiting the world, how does that work with grace? Mm -hmm. And that's what the whole last chapter is about is I have these kind of discussion of what's the relationship of virtue and grace. And, and I came to realize um, that the Christian tradition does not see those as in conflict with each other. But unfortunately, a lot of times our sub traditions within it do. And we kind of pit any effort or work as the opposite of grace. But if I might channel a little Dallas Willard here, who's a great person on the Sermon on the Mount as well, um, that the, you know, effort and grace are not enemies. They're not incompatible. Um, they're really not. And I know that's not how a lot of, you know, super reformed and super Lutheran people talk, but um, I don't know what to say except for read the Sermon on the Mountain and read the Bible, that, right. that it's a constant invitation. But it's not, a, it's not an invitation to earn your favor or something. It's an invitation to find life. Then you're only going to find life uh, through following. And if I might just cast a line, I don't know who you're going to talk to chapter 11 about, but or with, with whom you're going to talk about chapter 11, but I think the the really, for me, the personal and maybe the nuclear core of Matthew is eleven twenty-five to 30, um, where Jesus, and it relates to this, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to little children. This is your gracious will. All things be handed over to me by the Father. No one knows the Son except for the Father. No one's the Father except for the Son. It sounds like the Gospel of John. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like super high Christology. And then he says, verse 28, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest or shalom or flourishing or peace. Mm -hmm. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So, you know, those verses are ones that we probably don't think a lot about, but they 
are, I think, crucial to understanding Matthew, including the sermon, in that Jesus is inviting us to find life and rest and shalom and flourishing in this paradoxical way of actually submitting ourselves to something other than our own desires, and that is submitting ourselves to the way of Christ, not out of duty, but out of joy, because only then will we find life. And I think the Sermon on the Mount is really one of the unpackings of that yoke. It's not a, it's not a legalism. It's an invitation to find life by, through obedience. Yeah. We, I mean, we, uh, what do you think about this? Is it kind of a, let's say, trick? I don't know if trick's the right word. But, <laughs> you know, when people do read the Sermon on the Mount in that way and, and read it as basically a call to, let's say, ethical actions, and they say, well, I can't do any of this. Yeah. It, I mean, is that in some ways a trick to get away from the demands that are there? Or, I mean, is that a fair criticism of that way of reading it, you think? Or Yeah, one scholar many years ago, a few decades ago, wrote a whole book on the history of the interpretation of the sermon that is a book just kind of cataloging different ways people have read the sermon. And he labeled them all evasions of the sermon <laughs> because basically what he said is like all the ways that we like try to squirm out of doing what it right, says, right. you know, uh, and it's mostly not conscious probably. I don't sure. think most people that are reading it are trying to get out of it, but there is a sense in which we do feel the pinch of it. Mm. And one way to get out of discomfort is with big theological ideas mm. that you can kind of distance yourself from the, the pinch of the text. So mm. I don't know that it's a conscious motive, but I do think it happens um, for us. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't want to evade the sermon, but we do <laughs> have one different question, sure. All right. not on the sermon that we want to talk to you about, uh, which is a blurb. So we like to end our episodes asking for some kind of recommendation. And it could be a book, but it could be a life hack or a movie or a TV show, anything that you've recently enjoyed and you think other people might enjoy wow. as well. Oh so my. something you want to blurb for I us. think like a blurb for the for the, for the podcast. <laughs> yes, right? well, like you while you've like, got me on we'll here, will you give us a blurb for the podcast? <laughs> um, oh, man, that is so tough. I read, I'm a, I read a ton of novels. So I'm a, so I never know what's whatever I'm currently reading. So I don't know what to recommend for that. Um, so what is it? Just a recommend of anything? So a life we hack? Had one person who recommended a kind of soap. One person. <laughs> Dying to know what one Dale person who was Brent Strong. Uh, okay, nice. yeah. Someone recommended um, making your own duct tape wallet, which she had done. <laughs> but you don't have to do a life hack. I mean, I'm curious because I love novels, but I have a hard time finding new ones that are good. Because yeah. the good thing about classics yeah. is that you know they've gone right. through the test of yeah. time. So how do you yeah. do that? How do you find stuff to read? Yeah. Um, asking other interesting people what they're reading. You well, know? we're asking you. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't like to tell people. I just like to ask people. Oh, gosh. I mean, oh, uh, it's it's always dangerous, you know, because, like, <laughs> might be some risque stuff in there. But uh, I think if you have, if you, if people here have not read George Saunders, uh-huh. you've got to, I mean, he's the best short story writer right uh-huh. now. And... And he is just so fun to read. Or Ted Chiang, if you've read him as well. So he is a short story writer as well. And both of them are super intelligent, very funny, clever um, stories that make you think about what it means to be human and make you think about culture. Um, Which is why I read a lot of science fiction as well. Because good science fiction helps you think about human culture in a kind of roundabout way. Um, and neither of them are exactly science fiction writers. They're kind of genre bending, but they have some elements in their stories that are surreal. They're, they're surreal authors. Yeah. So I'd write Sander, George Saunders, and, uh, and Ted Chiang. There we go. Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan. And duct tape wallets. Those yes. are fine, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jonathan, for taking us on this guided tour through the Sermon on the Mount. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, everyone who's listening and everyone who's here. We thank you thank all you. for coming. And yeah, let's give uh, Dr. Pennington a hand. So for our podcast listeners, well, I mean, actually, y'all could do this, too. Um, if you really, flourishing 
is the one who gives a five-star review to a podcast <laughs> that they listen to. Uh, if I was going to write a beatitude, that's what I would say. You so you could pull you out your phones right now, go to Apple Podcasts, find the two testaments, put the five-star review on if you enjoyed your uh, what you just listened to. It'll help other people find the podcast it helps other and listen to how to have a flourishing life. There you go. Mm. Yeah. So thanks for being here, thanks, and God. thanks for listening. The Two Testaments is produced with support from Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to you, our fellow travelers, who support this journey by donating on our website, thetwotestaments.com. Thanks also to Cam Thomas, Joe Zelder, and the team in the Sanford Faculty Success Center, and our student assistants for their help with production, editing, and promotion. Yeah.